How did you go about calibrating your sense of what this space could be in relation to the work of Clifford Still? Well, <clears throat> um, well, I knew, I guess I, I discovered for myself his paintings when I was at Columbia, and I saw the paintings at the Met for the first time. So I knew the work, I knew the work of his peers. But when this project came up, I felt like I knew what it needed to be already. I just, yeah. I could feel the work, and I don't know if it's because of the landscapes he was raised in. Yeah. You know, North Dakota and teaching in the Palouse in Washington. But I just felt like I knew yeah. what it needed to be. And the first thing was natural light. Yeah. I just felt like that was my mission. Right. Is to put these paintings in natural light. Yeah. So that's really how it started. You know, you and I talked about awe. Yeah. I mean, if ever there was awe in paintings. Yeah. I mean, that, that, and I think it has tremendous amount. I mean, I'm from the West and the landscapes of the West, and it's had a huge impact on me. So I yeah. do think whatever is in there, I think I could viscerally feel it from the very beginning. For me, I, I grew up um, thinking that I was never really that interested in nature. I actually don't think I'm particularly interested in nature, mm. but there is no way you can go up to those mountains yeah and look out and not be, not feel something, mm -hmm. and not to try to find the language for it. Um, and I feel the same way in this space, and it's something that people have remarked upon, mm -hmm. you know, to me. Um, you know, visitors, people I give tours to, to. this is something that um, visitor services, uh, when they're at the front desk, there are a number of, uh, on a regular basis, visitors who come in and are moved to tears, wow. who wow. have this experience of this building mm -hmm. that is spiritual in nature, I think. Um, and there is, I think, something about coming into this space where it's undeniable that, you know, our bodies shift a mm -hmm. little, our sense of time, our sense of space, our sense of light shifts a little? Mm -hmm. No, I, um, I've said many times that for me, museums, part of, the, part of the purpose of a museum, the building itself, is to open you up yep. so that you can see yeah. and, and initiate a new relationship with things. And I think part of the language of building and architecture is that mm -hmm. sense of wonder. And I think when it strikes you, it opens you. Yeah. And I, that's what you, you, you're that kind of awe of this, or that kind of sense of sublime and wonder and romanticism of landscape, and you think you're, you think it's romantic and, and stereotypical, and you right. think you're immune to it, and then you right. sit in those landscapes. Yeah. And that's what, it, whenever I go back to those powerful places, I'm always, it's like starting over again. Yeah. Yeah, you, you have no defenses against it, right? If we fully embrace the capacity of museums to open us up to the world. Um, and not just any world, but the specific world of a work of art or a body of work, like paintings in this case. It really, I mean, it, it is such a kind of like unusual way to approach what museums can do. No, and I, and I love that. Well, the, the fact that people tear up is probably my ultimate fantasy, to tell you the truth. And we've talked about this a little bit before, that um, I think when things are excruciatingly specific are when they kind of transcend some of our defenses. Right, right. right. right? They, they, they can kind of uh, become fulcrums to, to, to new experience that way. And it has nothing to do with them being novel, nothing to do with them being new, yeah. you know, in any kind of formal way. Yeah. But I think that kind of focus, that kind of really concentrated specificity is something that we just don't encounter. Also, you know, you talked about natural light being the kind of point of departure for uh, your, your thinking. 
but light is also this this problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's this, you know, especially in Denver where we are so close to heaven, um, the intensity is, of is the sun. Yes, <laughs> yeah, we're so close to heaven. Of course. Um, <laughs> you know, so like we're so close to the sun. We're so close. Yeah, 360 that, days of yeah, sunlight. Yeah. That there's such a kind of, that the intensity of that light is something that, you know, you also had to consider, right? Because the light is exactly what makes the paintings come alive. Mm -hmm. But it's also the thing that really can destroy a painting, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, with the amount of bare canvas and also works on paper. Um, what I find incredibly moving about the solution that you all came up with is this, you know, the, this feature of the ceiling and how it, you know, serves to let the light in, but also protect the works mm -hmm. on view as well. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you talk a bit about how you came to this mm -hmm. particular solution. Um, well, back, back to Denver and heaven. <laughs> um, I really wanted the building, because of the gift of light that is Denver, I wanted the, the entire building to be about light, mm -hmm. every surface mm -hmm. to take light and represent it in a different way. Yeah. You know, thus the broken fins on the exterior, right. the subtleness of some of the concrete finishes right. inside. I mean, that, that all of the surface basically make light yeah. in some way. So having the ceiling make light was just a natural yeah. extension of that. And then, you know, we'd been working with some very sophisticated lighting designers and engineers for a long time. So in that 10 feet that's above the top of the art walls here, is where it all happens. And right. that dimension is everything. Yeah. It, it's really interesting. It has, it has a lot to do with diffusion right. and surfaces that things bounce off of yeah. that mediate the intensity of that light. Yeah. And then it also has to do with distance, just yeah. the fall. It's almost like if you think about light like rain or yeah. something, that you, you allow it distance to fall and disperse. And then by the time it hits the paintings, and then learning what your eye sees. Like there's quite a range of light on these walls, but your yeah. eye, we work within that range that your eye doesn't see. Right. It's so fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think we were kind of at the peak of the knowledge at the time that we did this, what, which allowed it to be what it is, to find this light. Yeah. The light that someone called, during the opening, someone called it liquid light. Yeah which I thought was the most perfect description. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's so unusual to have a quality of light in galleries for paintings as big and as subtle as these mm -hmm. and not have glare, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and it, I love the idea that there's this distance that we don't see in gallery. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that space is also packed with a, a kind of entire... Yeah. You know, organism, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I mean, the museum yes. itself is like an organism yeah. that has all of these invisible parts that ensure that, for example, no moisture makes it yeah, yeah. from so the nice. skylights to the galleries or the paintings. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, there's an entire kind of automated system that ensures that there's not too much light um, coming into the galleries. Yeah, it's interesting now, the technology which gets into the day lighting systems and the electric lighting systems, it's, it's, it's almost like an instrument you can yeah. play. Yep. It's got to be fun as a curator. I mean, I think that was part, of, part of my motivation is to yeah, just yeah. To make it something that the curators can really engage. I think you and I have talked about um, the specificity mm -hmm. of both the architecture and this painting mm -hmm. and the ways in which the building, the museum, the painting actually invites us to come up with a completely different vocabulary mm -hmm. for what abstraction is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, when we look at the word abstraction, it's usually an abstracting from, mm -hmm. a taking away from. Mm -hmm. And the language that I am moved to use mm -hmm. when in the presence of these paintings and also in this space mm -hmm. is, or, or, you know, I, I'm moved to say things like, manifestation, 
you know. No, and the lack of narrative. I, I think, I mean, this, this has been a conversation in all the work that Allied Works because we are abstract architects, um, that abstraction is an evocative act, right? It's not a, yeah. it's not a, to your point, not a reductive act, not a, not an avoidance of anything, but it, but it is something that is intended to evoke, and to help you again open up, and, and help you see. I, th yeah. I think the, 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 the lack of narrative description or summary requires a more active engagement. Yep, absolutely. Right? And I think that's also what's interesting about this work is when you come back, you see different things in paintings that you think you know. Yeah. Right? You notice different things. You let different things in. But yeah, that, that's, I think that's the power of, of, of abstraction. And again, I think the power of abstraction is, is emotion. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not about your head. You know, it's, it's, it's not about trying to explain anything. It's really trying to just move you. Yeah. And, and again, that was one of the very early motivations, too, is to make a place in the arts district in Denver that you want to be, right? Yeah. And, and, and you're lucky enough to be here with these paintings. Yeah. But if you've been here 10 times, you still want to just be here. And you want to walk through at lunch, or you want to bring your aunt and uncle through, or, yeah. you know, it just becomes a place that evokes a, a sense in you that you don't get anywhere else. Yeah. Right. And it's a sense that I think we need now more than ever. Um, I spent this weekend giving a tour uh, of the museum to a group of uh, practitioners and researchers who are interested in coming up with solutions to um, healthcare workers burning out because of the pandemic. And they were incredibly moved by the space. There's nothing frenetic in this space, yeah. right? It allows you to find something like center and focus right. and to attend to how are you doing, <laughs> you know? How are we doing? Well, isn't, isn't that, I mean, certainly the, one of the reasons I've been drawn to museums my whole life is that opportunity for introspection. Yep. I mean, when do we get those opportunities? Yeah, that's rare. Yeah, when are there spaces that, we, to, that invite? I mean, I'm, you and I talked early on about this building having that sense of, of, of sanctuary or, yeah. or even a chapel like yeah. and you know people could take that critically you know in that it does have a sense of elevation but I think it's elevation of the individual yeah, absolutely. because it affords that opportunity to step away from yeah. the day-to-day -day, step away from the endless entertainment and information and all of the things we're bombarded with and to just sort of breathe and breathe and look Breathe and be. Yeah, breathe and be. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. I think precisely against that backdrop, the sense of safety mm -hmm. and refuge right. that this space affords mm -hmm. is one of the reasons mm -hmm. why mm -hmm. some of our visitors are moved to tears mm -hmm. because they, they, they get respite, right? Mm -hmm. I really do see this museum as a living testament to what amazing things can happen when a community comes together mm -hmm. and commits to visionary ideas, you know, and mm -hmm. to take an enormous risk mm -hmm. to build this home mm -hmm. for this amazing resource, mm -hmm. right? I, I don't know of anyone who isn't moved by these paintings. Yeah. I mean, you, you, yeah. c you can be completely unexposed to, you know, the era of mid-century American painters. You can be completely unexposed to anything. And these paintings evoke something in you that nothing else, yeah. nothing else can, I think. In this setting, yeah. yeah. And I think it really is in this setting. I mean, I've seen Stills paintings out in the wild before. Right, out in the wild. You know. I love that. I love that way um, of thinking about it. Let's, let's see his paintings in the yeah. wild. That's right, instead of home. Right. Yeah, and you know, I think it's 
when they're out in the wild, um, they still have to, they do actually have to compete, right? Yeah. They, they do actually have to, and compete not in a sense of like, is this better than the next? Mm -hmm. But that there is, um, there's a kind of interference there's that also, you don't have here. There's also a kind of consumerism, yeah. right? In, in the general museum and in larger museums where it's, it's the next room, the next gallery, yeah. the next yeah. piece. Let's look at Rothko, let's look at Barnett Newman. I mean, there's something wonderful seeing Seeing them together, yeah. Yeah, periods together. Sure. It's true, but it does create. I mean, you... you, you on to the next one. Yeah, you're yeah. on to the next one. Yeah. And that's why you get so exhausted in those. Yeah. But here, yeah, you can, you can kind of just be in the presence. Yeah. I, I love the... I mean, the, 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 the way the section was designed. And when you're down there, you, you get a glimpse of the other oh, up here gosh, with people yeah. walking the bridge yeah. and the light filtering down. Yeah. And the exchange between those two worlds was was critical from the very start. Yeah. Again, another gift of this, of this collection. Yeah. When you were talking about the, the ways in which the light, our, our awareness of natural light, how it changes over time, we become highly attuned to the fact that these paintings are not fixed. Mm -hmm. Our experience of the painting changes over time. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that also really helps redefine what a museum is, right? Instead of a museum being a place where art is shown and preserved, like, you know, on some level as a, as a kind of reserve, the dynamism is much more subtle, right? Each time we p bring a painting out, no matter how many times it's been shown, our sense of it changes not only because of the change in light, but also the world around us has changed. Right. The demands upon us have changed. Mm -hmm. And what I find remarkable about this building and the way that it's scaled to human beings, I mean, it's scaled to us, not only because of the size of the walls, the height of the ceilings, but also because of the sense of time that unfolds mm -hmm. when you're in this space. Mm -hmm. Even though you're in a very protected, specific, intentional place yeah. that's framing these relationships with these art, this art, right. you're still a part of the world right. because it is changing with the weather and you do yeah. feel connected. Yeah. I think, and I, that, that's a bigger connection, I think, than even I was aware of yeah. in, in designing the building is that it, it breaks the boundaries of the museum, yep. right? Because it's the same light you just left. Right. And again, right. it's, it's mediated and transformed, but it's still a part of that same place. So it lends a kind of phenomenological transparency. I would love to kind of play on this idea of shelter, right? Mm -hmm. That we're alert to the extent to which this space offers shelter, shelter from, um, but also a kind of shelter that's nourishing, right? Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about when it comes to awe, ideas like the sublime, mm -hmm. is that the, you know, the sublime is not something that you experience because you are in actual danger, right? You actually have to see it from a distance, from a position of safety. Mm -hmm. And I've been really thinking a lot about how important it is that our sense of awe, the sense of elevation, the sense of the sublime mm -hmm. that we get from the paintings, but also from this space. Mm -hmm also has something to do with how hmm. calm mm -hmm. it feels right. and how, again, against the backdrop of mm -hmm. the pandemic, mm -hmm. how it really has been built to encourage a kind of circulation of light, of distance, mm -hmm. but also being near, right? Mm -hmm. It's something that, that's really become striking I love that notion of shelter. I, I, it's, it's another word we haven't used, which yeah. I, I really like that. Because it, 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 it again takes away the stigma of the kind of boundary making that museums do, you right. know, in right. some way, and, and really creates a different set of, a different kind of invitation that you're really offering shelter yeah. from things. Shelter and focus.
Shelter and focus, yeah. yeah. Because and community. I mean, like, it's also yeah. within the context of that. Yeah, because yeah, you're never here alone. Or right. if you are, you're really lucky <laughs> to be here alone. <laughs> but no, the, 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 I talk about that quite a bit, that one of architecture's primary <clears throat> tools or tri primary assets or abilities is to, to frame and focus, to, yep. to amplify. Yep. And I think you, architecture amplifies relationships, emotions, experience by what it chooses to include. Right. Right. It's a. It's a kind of. A, it's a sifting process. Yeah. Making making a building like this, right. whether you include natural light, the right. scale of it, right, the sense of monumentality or intimacy, yeah. kind of setting up those relationships. And it's so different. Every city, it's different. Every yep. institution is different. Every mission is different. And they manifest Sometimes. different values. Right. Yeah. They do. And it was, it, was, it was really clear between the light, between how do, you, how do you get people interested in however subtly in coming back. Sure. Right? Like, I just need to go through the still. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of my dream, frankly. Yeah. If people just say, I haven't been there in a while. I just need to go through. And they do think, say that. I think the architecture is one, yeah. frankly. Yeah. But, but, and, and to do that in this neighborhood, it was really clear. One of the reasons the, the park is out front right. right, is because I wanted this to be a place of refuge. Right. This neighborhood is big, and now it's getting bigger. The buildings are, around it are big right. <laughs> and have big personalities, right. big institutional presence. Right. And this place could be that kind of safety and sanctuary and right. offer that. A break. A break. Exactly. I have to say I'm grateful every day that I'm in this building, um, that I get to traverse the galleries, that I get to, you know, again, I work here and I am grateful every day that I have a day, I have a reminder every time I walk by that storage um, of why we exist and who we are for. Hmm. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to to join us today for this conversation. But moreover, I want to thank you for this amazing building. Well, it's such a gift to come back. Well, and to meet you, right? The, the next generation and, and, the, and the future of the institution. And it's also a gift to come back after 10 years. I mean, I've been back intermittently, mm -hmm. but certainly now for sure, there's something where it's, there's a distance for me where it's not my building anymore. Yeah. I get to just enjoy it. I yeah. get to see it. I'm liberated <laughs> so, in some ways, right? From yeah. being the architect and I can just come as a visitor to the Still Museum, albeit with certain privileges, yeah. <laughs> right? But I can just come and enjoy it and, and really let myself be in it, yeah. which is the real treat of coming back. Yeah. So thank I you. Love